Very well. Um, so good morning, everyone. My name is Juan Pablo Hofmeister, and uh, it's my pleasure to uh, be moderating this session where uh, we will be building on some of the discussions that we've been having since yesterday. And uh, specifically as we start considering how GCF can better serve you uh, as uh, we enter the new phase of uh, NDC's uh, implementation. So the session, in fact, is uh, in, uh, titled Investment Planning for NDC Implementation, uh, where we will be going through a little bit of uh, this process that we have outlined um, as we are trying to structure support for the next phase of uh, uh, GCF resources on the GCF2. Um, and we will also be having uh, a, a, some feedback and listening to the experience of countries and partners in this process of turning NDCs from uh, a document that gets submitted to the UNFCCC into actual um, uh, bankable action. So the session will be structured as follows. We will be first uh, um, hearing from two colleagues from the GCF Secretariat that are right now um, working quite hard in, in understanding how better to support countries uh, dealing with some of the challenges going from uh, a submitted NDC towards an implemented NDC. Um, we will then actually be uh, looking to hear from you, uh, get your feedback. Um, and be after that, we will be moving to a panel uh, where we will be hearing from country representatives um, so let me start now first with just a quick introductory presentation. Um, so if I can get uh, the PowerPoint uh, on the screen. So um, next slide, please. So we know uh, the uh, NDCs um, uh, yesterday, like I said, actually in the morning session, uh, we have already about a hundred, more than 150 NDCs that have been uh, uh, revised uh, and submitted to the UNFCCC. And the needs uh, that have been uh, outlined from these NDCs are clear. And, uh, and, and we, we don't need to actually unpack that question at this moment. We have now matured beyond that stage where it's a question of, uh, of NDCs. We have now have a, a strong process under the Paris Agreement where new NDCs will continue to be submitted, revised, and it's going to be an iterative process. The real question we're facing is where do we go from there? How do we support countries in going from that uh, document that gets submitted? And here I'm actually equally uh, applying this to the NAPs, not only to, to the NDCs, uh, but any, any of these documents that sort of set direction how do we go about um, shifting uh, and, and, and moving from, from this process of just submitting the document um, towards implementation? The NDCs is currently submitted. Um, and by the way, the, all this information, it's uh, extracted in collaboration from the UNFCCC uh, needs-based finance process. All this information um, uh, already sort of identifies the needs in terms of billions, uh, uh, according to uh, in different regions, according to different sectors, and also according to just the, the overall number of needs that have been identified as uh, being required for implementing an NDC. So where does one go from there? And if we can go to the next slide. Um, the same thing goes, and this is again the, uh, from this end, um, needs-based finance assessment uh, on adaptation needs. Um, uh, more clear trends actually come up when we start looking at adaptation needs in NDCs uh, in terms of, for example, a str very strong emphasis on investment uh, required for ecosystems. Um, and uh, well, the, the, the key message that I wanna leave you with here is that the needs have been well-established, the costs have been uh, have be, are becoming well established as well. There is definitely some work to do around the costing uh, of NDCs, but certainly uh, the, the the true next challenge is is actually going from uh, these identified needs towards implementation and investment. So for that, if we can go to the next slide, yesterday we presented um, this uh, this roadmap that we have been 
working to structure around um, how one goes from that very step one where your document is submitted, how one goes to the different stages um, around building evidence, uh, how one goes about investment planning, um, how one goes about um, structuring different op options that match uh, and, and do the require financial engineering. Um, and this is where we hope we will be putting a lot of our, our, our energy in GCF2 in helping you go from, from these submitted NDCs towards implementation. So yesterday, if we can go to the next slide, um, we actually did take a poll um, and we asked you um, in the context of, of these different uh, steps that are required and where support is required, we asked you to identify where, where this should support should be prioritized. And this is results taken directly from the poll that my colleague Selena and Ramona took yesterday uh, from this room where we identified, um, uh, where you actually identified that in fact, two of the, obviously the, the top area where support is required, needless to say, is in update, is in, in, in concept notes and funding proposals. And clearly that is part of what this whole process is about, but as an enabling step to get to this, um, to this uh, element, um, the, the prioritization yesterday sort of showed the need to focus on building capacity and expertise to uh, strength, to use climate assessment into decision making and also, uh, uh, also how to do the investment planning, including uh, matching sources and financial support uh, and financial structuring. So these were the two um, uh, elements that were highlighted in addition, of course, to concept notes and, and NDCs. So it is with that that I would like to invite two uh, panelists to the, to the stage uh, to come and share a little bit uh, of the perspective of uh, the GCF in terms of how we are trying to tackle these two priorities that you have identified. So I'd like to invite my colleague, uh, Kevin and Majoresh, and I will introduce them in a second. If you can please uh, join me here in the, and on the stage. Thank you very much. So first, um, Kevin, who is our climate science lead. Um, Kevin, I'd like to um, reflect in on, on these findings uh, from and these priorities that we heard yesterday. Um, the GCF has proposed a framework uh, for supporting NDC investment planning that makes emphasis on evidence-based approaches in multiple steps. Um, and yesterday, the participants identified this um, so what I'd like to um, hear your, your views is precisely on what the GCF is doing and what the, the, the possible steps are for supporting capacity, expertise, the development of tools, et cetera, to use climate assessments in decision-making. Um, uh, the floor is yours. Whatever you, okay. You can sit there, it's fine. We have the next slide, please. Uh, yeah, if we can have Kevin's PowerPoint, please. It's just whilst we're waiting for that. Um, choosing adaptation options from a country's perspective and assessing them from a funder's perspective is incredibly complex. And obviously no, no single approach will ever be able to deal with the, the range <laughs> the wrong one. Um, of, of adaptation actions, uh, because not every approach is applicable to every climate risk in every context. Um, and uncer uncertainties in the future climate combined with you know, the harsh realities of moving finance and capacity um, it implies that good adaptation needs to be designed for flexibility and for adaptive management. So we'll have some slides coming in a minute which show some principles. Hopefully we'll get those soon. Um, it's clear from the IPCC and from other literature that climate action and sustainable development are interdependent and that mainstreaming adaptation into existing governance, existing policy is essential for all successful outcomes. Um, so having, you know, having stressed the complexity, it's possible to construct a guidance framework 
for the selection of activities and, and for the preparation of uh, concept notes and funding proposals to the GCF or indeed to other funders um, for adaptation, which is where my slides will focus, but um, equally uh, these tools are, are useful for cross-cutting proposals and mitigation too. Is the presentation coming at some point? Um, I think before, just before we, I talk through the slides that I hope will appear very shortly, um, it's just worth stressing that country ownership is the foundation stone uh, as reflected in the needs that um, Juan showed in one of his slides just now. Here we go. Um, perfect timing. So at the most recent GCF board meeting in July, um, our board adopted these principles, um, which are guidance for, as you can see, mitigation and for adaptation. And the driver was to make, make sure that, that there is a transparent and a consistent approach um, to the assessment of funding proposals by ourselves at the Secretariat, also our, our independent technical advisory panel, um, as well as providing a framework of guidance to help select and identify um, the most appropriate options. Uh, so in terms of the, these, these principles help demonstrate um, the climate impact potential, which is one of the six investment criteria. They speak to some of the other uh, investment criteria as well. Um, and so if you just focus on adaptation, um, proposals should show how the activity addresses the current and or future climate change and why it's likely to be an effective solution. That, that should not be uh, surprising to anyone. Uh, proposals you know, need to identify the systems at risk, the climate change hazard affecting them. Um, and then the response, the, um, the proposal needs to explain, and I'll come on to my next slide where I'll show some of the materials that we're developing to help um, articulate these principles. Uh, proposals need to explain how the activity will reduce the exposure and the vulnerability of people or systems or, or ecosystems and, and thus lessen the risk uh, and the impact. And then thirdly, uh, activities need to align with national plans and climate strategies, including uh, inter alia, uh, NAPs, NAPAs, other long-term climate strategies, um, other adaptation communications, and of course NDCs as, as applicable. And this helps cement the country ownership. And then finally, uh, the proposal needs to contain a description of the monitoring and evaluation system um, in order that it can be monitored effectively. And crucially, the board decision recognised that following these principles, um, which constitutes a framework of guidance, not a, not a menu, um, following these principles is assisted by using the best available information, which we recognise can come from a variety of sources and must be adapted to the data availability, the context and the capacities of any specific country or region. Uh, recognising this, um, the GCF makes no prescription of any particular source of information or data, um, but we will be providing uh, materials to help access all of the most uh, effective information and best practice. That said, and if we can move on to the second slide, please, um, the GCF is committed to an ongoing collaboration with the World Meteorological Organization uh, to improve the climate information platform, which you can see on the top left there, which was introduced at, at COP26. Um, in fact, this week, there is a parallel workshop going on in Johannesburg where the WMO are, trained, are providing training um, at the country level to four countries in, in South Africa using South Africa as a base, um, and we're committed to continuing this collaboration with the WMO to maintain and to improve that climate information platform. Uh, so that ongoing workshop at the moment, I hope, uh, shows that there is some, uh, some response to the prioritised support area that, that came out of yesterday's poll. Uh, the information portal uh, provides easy and accessible entry to the IPCC model data, um, uh, and, and of course, under the WMO auspices, it has a certain degree of authority. Um, used in combination with uh, more general guidance, which the GCF will be preparing, and that's really what the other uh, picture on the slide here, um, the, this portal and, and that training will help provide countries, accredited entities, particularly direct access entities, with enhanced support in the development of their uh, climate action proposals. And so the um, the... Let the right-hand side of that slide shows other actions that the Secretariat is taking. Um, so the box called the Climate Information Gateway, the intention is to provide links to all available country-level climate risk profiling, uh, mitigation methodologies, because this is for mitigation as well as adaptation, uh, and climate uh, model information platforms. Um, the gateway is there to enable uh, us to share solutions, uh, to overcome problems, to share information through frequently asked questions. And then... The blue box is um, 
a, a climate information expert advisory group, which is being convened for the first time in Geneva this sep uh, later this month in September. And this international expert forum uh, will provide oversight of all of the climate information that all of our stakeholders need. And the idea behind the forum is to make sure that we have complementarity, avoidance of duplication in terms of our efforts with the other funders, um, identifying any gaps in climate information which require to be filled, and then providing a more effective and timely response in filling those gaps. And the, the overall objective, very simply, is to provide countries and accredited entities with clear and consistent guidance, uh, which allows you to develop the highest quality demonstration of climate impact, uh, leading to proposals um, that accelerate access to GCF financing and financing from other climate funds. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Kevin. Um, and we will be going uh, in a few minutes looking for, for your questions, uh, looking to be, have this be more, more of a dialogue. Uh, before um, actually opening the floor for questions, I'd like to invite my colleague, Magyarez, uh, from the GCF private sector facility. Um, he's the financial institutions manager. And, and Magyarez, I'd like to invite you um, uh, with a similar question, basically, but actually to hear from you on uh, the experience and the, the perspective on how we can work with countries uh, to do this matching and, and financial structuring and engineering, uh, realizing of course that these are complex terms and uh, certainly uh, your um, guidance will, will be most helpful. Majoresh. Thanks, Con. And, and thanks for raising this question at an appropriate time. That you know, once the countries have identified the indices and have identified the investments that they would like to see, the next step is you know how do we finance those? How do we arrange finance for that? Uh, to to answer to your question, maybe I will uh, you know I'll take liberty and try to break it up into three parts. One but is you know let me share you know what's uh, what's financial structuring uh, and why is it required in the context of GCS. Uh, second, maybe I can talk about uh, what could be the approaches to financial engineering uh, and structuring in context of GCF? And third is, you know, again, what GCF is doing and how GCF can help countries in uh, going forward on this in this regard. Now, financial structuring, you know, as we typically see in context of GCF, is in, in a layman language, it means that having understood that this is the project cost, this is the funding requirement, how do we uh, match with suitable sources and suitable financial instruments. So how do we decide whether we provide a grant financing for this, whether we provide a senior loan, subordinated loan, a junior equity or a reimbursable instrument, you know, and that kind of uh, suite of uh, financial products that GCF has. Uh, second, why it is required, the single most important purpose of financial structuring in context of GCF projects is to make the projects viable. So we are not here for increasing the returns for GCF, but the returns in context of climate impact. So, so viability of the project has to be driven by the steps that we take under the financial structuring. Now, let me move to what could be the approach to uh, financial structuring, you know, and 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 with having full will ha having full regard to the macroeconomic situation in the country, uh, there could be you know qualitative and quantitative factors one can consider in deciding the optimal mix of financial structure for project or for a program also. And factors one can consider could be like, you know, whether something starting with something as simple as is the project having a reflow potential. So, so you know, is there a reflow potential coming up from the project activities? Is it going to generate revenue by or, or is it going to, you know, maybe have material cost savings for the participants and for the countries? Second is, okay, having understood there is a reflow potential or not, if there is a reflow potential, is there some amount of certainty of the timing of the reflow or a reflows or these reflows are dependent on substantial uh, market factors which cannot be predicted at this stage also. Uh, third thing is, you know, the liquidity in the domestic market. And, and I will talk about each of this in, and, and how we use it in deciding the uh, instrument. And the fourth thing is... Uh, uh, risk perception and appetite of market participants, including the co-investors. Now, taking a very simple example of, you know, if you're talking about activity of uh, capacity building, and that may not have direct reflows, though it may in long run help the countries also, of course, that would warrant a 
grant financing uh, whereas consider a project where you know there is a project sponsor from private sector and he is willing to put so he, uh, some amount of equity financing but the domestic banks are not willing to take that kind of exposure and that's where gcf can step in by providing debt financing there could be situation where domestic banks are willing to provide some amount of credit exposure but they need some amount of cushioning from gcf and that cushioning can come by way of gcf taking a junior tranche risking position for vis-a-vis -vis the senior lenders also. Uh, there are investments done by GCF into, uh, uh, into equity pool. And this is where we see that these this investments require patient seed capital. So the reflows are going to be there, but the timing of reflow is uncertain because the reflows will materialize by way of exiting the investment through selling to a big investor or uh, you know market rewarding it in some other form or so. And in that situation for the patient capital, the best financial instrument could be equity instrument. To crowd in other investors, GCF does take a junior equity position provided you know, there is material co-financing that gets uh, generated. And of course, you know there could be situations where there is a willingness to uh, reflow, re repay to GCF, but at the same time, the participants do not have ability, the, the project uh, companies do not have ability to assume debt. In that situation, the best thing could be a reimbursable grant to be taken. Uh, one product that I didn't talk about, de-risking product, is the guarantee product. And this is where you know the liquidity in the domestic market comes into the picture. Think of a situation that you know a, a domestic market has got good amount of liquidity in local currency. The banks are willing to provide that fund, but they have they see that in our normal portfolio, we cannot take certain amount of risk because this is something really innovative that we are doing. In such situation, GCF can allow the banks to take provide funding, but GCF takes the credit exposure by providing the guarantee. So banks have a backup, a cushion and a de-risking coming up from GCF. Side. So that's largely on the approach to the financial uh, structuring that GCF can do. And now coming to the third part, the most important, you know, what GCF is doing about it. So GCF has applied all this suite of financial products, the grant, the reimbursable grant, the equity, the guarantee and, uh, you know, debt financing uh, at various project level. We have done at various program level. And as all of you know that, you know, we have a portfolio of 200 approved projects, uh, roughly 11 billion of financing. And with that portfolio and with that amount of financing, there has to be some learning that has to come up. So the learning from that is to accelerate the pace of climate finance and to accelerate the deepening of the impact at the same time, uh, you know, enhancing the country ownership. One way we can, you know, uh, go further is by uh, creating co-investment platform and by co-investment platform what we mean is uh, you know this 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 kind of investments this kind of structures require good amount of flexibility to uh, add new result areas new partners going forward so a program can have result areas different financial instruments but it still has got a broader framework uh, fixed at the at, 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 at the initiation of the program uh, a co-investment platform can be something where GCF seeds the initial capital. Uh, there is a country ownership by way of active involvement of domestic institutions, and we can have other multilateral, other uh, bilateral organizations financing, co-investing uh, in specific platform and in sub-platforms also. So that, that's that's the vision that we we like, and maybe you know for uh, new uh, areas such as maybe blue economy or hydrogen. Uh, uh, economy or so that that's that's the, that might be the way to go forward. Uh, thanks for your attention and happy to respond to any question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manjuresh. And uh, what I'd like to do now, um, it's actually uh, hear your reflections and uh, also, of course, uh, take any of your questions to to our two panelists before we move to the second part of this. Um, uh, of this session. Uh, we will be doing, uh, collecting your feedback in two ways. Uh, one, we will be uh, using a Mentipol uh, particular, first on the question of uh, um, building the evidence um, and, and supporting climate assessment and decision making. And what we'd like you to do here is free text, just drop your ideas of how is it that GCF can help you. Second, we would like to, my colleague Christian is going to help us um, uh, get your questions uh, and, and your comments. So if you would like to, um, to raise a point or ask a question to, to the panel, uh, please raise your hand 
Um, I am almost blind because of the lights here. So that's why we'll be uh, uh, relying on my colleague to, to help us gather those questions. I see a hand there. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Good morning, colleagues. Um, and thank you for this presentation. I, I sort of have a comment but of reflection, but also perhaps there's a question in there. Um, when we talk about implementing our NDCs, obviously they are programs or projects behind that in our investment plans. What we have to understand really well is this term called climate rationale. And within that term, there are tools and the requirement for climate data and information is becoming more and more acute. Um, the, the last board decision around climate data and tools in relation to climate rationale was an interesting one because for a lot of countries, uh, they don't actually even figure in the resolution of GCMs. And I can actually point out from a colleague, a Caribbean project, that had the scope of 15 GCMs within their uh, program, and they were asked by ITAP to basically validate those. So that's one example. The other example is that when we look at a country like Fiji, which is much, much larger than ourselves in the Cook Islands, is that uh, on a GCM, it doesn't even figure as one pixel. So the reality is, in terms of climate data and information, as that becomes more acute, how can that take place when global climate models don't even configure some countries? And yet there was a decision taken at the GCF board about this very issue, and it's under climate rationale. So we have all argued that there is not enough data, but now in actual fact, there is a decision made on data and it actually is not fit for purpose for a whole number of countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I uh, will ask you to please introduce yourself when you speak, but that was our colleague Wayne and DA from Cook Island. So thank you very much, Wayne. Um, any um, other, uh, I see if another hand over here, but I also don't want to miss on anyone in the back that I might not see. Maybe we'll get the microphone ready. If we can get a third question uh, line up so that uh, we, we go, uh, roll to the third question Thank you. Um, before I come back to um, our panelists. Yeah, <clears throat> this one works. Thank you. Um, my name is Maya Svaraza from Georgia, uh, representing the NDA. And at some point, my question would follow the previous question um, in regarding the climate data and climate information. Um, you mentioned the, during the first presentation, we have heard about the um, regional workshops on the climate uh, information and then supporting some- Sorry, Maya, can I ask you to get the mic? Okay, the is it Thank okay you. now? Thanks. Great, okay. Thanks. Uh, so regarding the climate information workshop that you have mentioned that is in parallel to our meeting, it's happening uh, in South Africa. Could you be Elaborate a bit more, what is the target of the workshop, whether it is uh, for supporting countries like, uh, for example, small island states, we have heard that there is no climate data at all. Uh, so is it uh, some kind of platform being created that will support the, um, the, the data formation or it's just a platform for uh, training or supporting countries somehow to to uh, develop or to create this data or just to implement or to write in the proposals. But if the data doesn't exist, probably it will be the problem. Uh, and whether you consider to have this type of regional events in other regions as well, or currently it's targeting the uh, African countries only. Thank you. Thanks. And do we have any more requests? Otherwise, I'll come to... All right. So, uh, Kevin, I believe both questions to you, uh, please. Sure, I'm happy to take both of those. Is that Wayne that's over there? Has he gone? 
It's not not waited for the answer. <laughs> anyway, um, so the the term climate rationale has, um, I, I think, frustrated many f for a long time. Uh, and one of the things that the recent board decision deliberated was whether we should try and define climate rationale. Uh, in the end, we decided not to do that. And that, that's probably wise because you, you ask two scientists to define something, um, you can spend 10 years disagreeing with one another. Um, what the decision did do very clearly, though, uh, and embedded within those principles that I spoke about, is it made it very clear that um, proposals for climate action coming to the GCF or indeed other uh, climate funders have to connect to climate change. So that, in my opinion, is what was always uh, interpreted by climate rationale, and the principles make that very clear, um, which, as I said, is, 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 is not and should not be a surprise. Uh, turning, turning then to the, to the data and information, um, wh where the board decision made real progress was in making explicitly clear that any proposal, and particularly for adaptation, um, concept notes and funding proposals have to use the best available data in the context of that country, of that country's capacity, and of the, um, the activity that's being proposed. So, so we finally have made explicit that the, the best available data is sufficient. And, and that, again, scientifically uh, makes perfect sense. Uh, I don't want to spend too long talking about the technical details of climate models, but I would be happy to speak with the question or indeed anyone else um, over, over coffee uh, to, to do that. Ah, yeah. uh, um, because, of course, the global climate models provide information at a certain, at a certain um, granularity. That's not always um, particularly useful for small island developing states. That's absolutely true. Um, one of the things we can do is we can work as a community to make sure that the, uh, the regional climate models, the smaller scale climate models, which are now in, in the current generation going down to tens of kilometers, have um, a, a, a good ensemble size and provide, um, provide easily interpretable information uh, for those smaller resolutions that is sometimes required. And that's that's one of the things that the um, the platform that I alluded to that we've developed with the um, the WMO does. It allows rapid access uh, to what, what are called the Cordex models. I don't want to get into too much technical detail here, but, but happy to talk more about that later, um, in order to establish um, that downscaled information. Um, and then turning to the training, of course, and this addresses both questions, um, the intent between ourselves and the WMO is that we roll this training out over many regions. I think a regional approach is best, and it's the one that best works with the way that the WMO is constituted, is to take a regional approach. Uh, but GCF, of course, will be providing, as I said, supplementary information of our own, and we then will take the best approach possible. It could be regional, it might be direct um, it might be country-led. Um, who, who are the recipients of that training was the question. Uh, so the answer is it's varied um, for that particular workshop. And, and again, it, it, it will differ between each workshop. Uh, the recipients there were the, uh, the NDAs in some cases, or their alternates, of course, because many of the NDAs are here. Um, the National Hydrological and Meteorological Services um, and others. Um, it's, it's certainly not an exclusive membership. The idea is just to provide the, the necessary capacity building because ultimately the best capacity building there is is institutional capacity building so that each country can look to itself to be able to find the best available information based on the best available data. So that's the capacity that we're aiming for, an institutional, a country-led approach where the country can take control of, of that issue. And then the final thing I wanted to say, and I alluded to it again, is this uh, this forum uh, which which we will convene for the first time um, in Geneva on the 27th of September. The idea of that forum is to answer these questions that have, uh, to some extent, frustrated many of us for, for a long time, is what are the requirements? Um, how? What is the best information in the absence of local observational data uh, for a particular sector or for a particular context? So we're convening um, international users of data as well as international providers of data so that we have a common expectation of what it is we're asking for in proposals so that there can be no outliers, so that you know, arbitrary questions, ad hoc questions, about why you have not used a specific data set should no longer occur because there will be consensus. So this forum is all about driving that consensus uh, to answer these, these complicated questions. So I hope that answers the question. If it doesn't answer it fully, um, please please do speak to me over lunch. Thank you, Kevin. And, and indeed, I think a lot of this will need to be conversations we, we take in the corridors as well. I know there is a couple more questions, but I would now like to turn 
to uh, our other panelists and we will be doing the same and coming back with some questions. I will ask Kevin and Majoresh to please stay with us um, so that we can answer any questions at the end. So if I may kindly invite um, uh, Mr. Gilson, Manuel Gomez uh, and uh, Mr. Joaquin Guajardo, uh, Mr. Oscar Guevara and um, Mr. Krishna Hari Pushkar of Nepal to please um, join us here on uh, the stage. While they, they come to uh, the stage, um, we are seeing some, some very useful um, suggestions in terms of how we can uh, help you uh, deal with this issue of climate assessments in decision making. Uh, a lot of suggestions around, of course, using tar in a targeted manner the readiness program, um, building on trainings, capacity building, and the development of certain inputs all ideas that, that we are capturing. Um, and as you've seen from your inputs yesterday, we, we are actually looking and going through this um, and uh, we'll be uh, looking to do justice to these, these suggestions. So with this, uh, thank you very much to the panel for very promptly coming to the stage. And I would like to um, start actually, um, if I may, with uh, Mr. Krishna Hari Pushkar of Nepal. Um, inviting you um, to please share your, your country perspective and what you have learned in planning climate interventions and investments. Um, any any um, suggestions or thoughts you can share on uh, the milestones that are important in this process from, from your experience uh, in turning um, uh, NDCs into, into investment, uh, your recommendations and most certainly what your recommendations are for us as GCF uh, to better support you. Uh, so Mr. Pushkar, please. Uh, good morning, colleagues and friends. Uh, Nepal strongly support world community commitment to keep temperature rise below 1.5 degrees Celsius. The government of Nepal hereby presents its NDC under the Paris Agreement. Our long-term strategy to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emission by 2050. And for that, our coverage would be energy, industrial process and product use, agriculture, forestry, and other land use and waste. By 2030, expand clean energy greenhouse from approximately 1400 megawatt to 50,000 megawatt. Out of this 5,000 megawatt is an un unconditional target. Sales of electric vehicles in 2025 will be 25% of all private passenger vehicles. To make this happen, Government of Nepal has recently announced to build 1200 megawatt Burigandki hydropower project, waste city of 750 megawatt capacity, and so on. By 2030, we have uh, considered several targets, and also new sales of e vehicles would cover 90% of all private sectors, private vehicles, at least 25% household would use electric stroves will also cover 45% of land by forest, organic fertilizer production, plants to reach 100 by 2030. And some of the thematic areas are agriculture and food security, forest biodiversity, water seed conservation, water resources and energy, rural and urban settlement, industry, transport and, transport and physical infrastructure, tourism, natural and cultural heritage, health, drinking water and sanitation, disaster risk reduction and management. The cost of achieving Nepal's NDC conditional mitigation target is estimated to be 25 billion USD. The cost of un unconditional target is estimated to be 3.4 billion USD. To achieve conditional targets, Nepal expects financial, technological, and capacity building support from the global funds as GCF, GEF, Adaptation Fund, LEC Fund, 
and bilateral and multilateral development funds provided by the partners. So in the case of Nepal, we have several issues and huge commitment about NDC and we are also working to conclude our long-term strategy at earliest. As many of you know that the one of the critical points for Nepal is melting the snow and some other issues in the Himalayan region that has put 1.5 billion people reach out from the water. So we plan 45 billion USD from the public and private sector by 2030, 2030 and unconditional 3.2 billion by ourselves. So especially in the case of GSP, we really need technological support, resource and some other, some other support since the project planning, development and investment. We need a special guidance from the GCL. Thank you. I stop here. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Bukha, for your very concrete suggestions. Um, I would like to uh, now turn to Mr. Gilson Manuel Gomez of, of Cape Verde um, for your perspectives on, on these same questions. Um, I, I believe we have, if we can roll one of the mics there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to all. Uh, before I go, let me just to do some introduction of my, my country, Cape Verde, and just through the analysis uh, and how we want to do in terms of the climate investment in Cape Verde. Uh, I don't know if you know, Cape Verde is a small country located um, 500 uh, kilometers from, from uh, uh, Dakar. And we were so small, that means we were completely dependent from, from abroad. Um, but we have, uh, in terms of, let me say, the ambitions for, for, for our country, for the next 10, 10 years, we want to achieve at least 50% um, of renewable energy. And by 2040, we want to achieve 100% of renewable energy in, in Cape Verde. Uh, why we want to do that is not only for climate issues. Um, has been said, uh, Cape Verde, in Cape Verde, Climate issues or climate change is not only for environment problem, but is also for economic problem. So, why we want to do that? We want to change Cape Verde. Want, if you want to change Cape Verde, we want to look for what we have to do and what should be done for Cape Verde. First, uh, to achieve 100% of renewable energy in Cape Verde is uh, related to the, the main potential we have in Cape Verde is about the tourism. How we can say how we can link tourism with climate change? How we can link tourism with um, sustainable uh, development growth in in Cape Verde? At the same time, instead of tourism, tourism is the, the main engine of growth in Cape Verde. But we have also potential for a blue economy. So when we look to that and we look to the problem that we have in Cape Verde, in Cape Verde we have uh, we import at least eighty percent of our consumption. And we do not have way to produce in Cape Verde because we have a water problem. And at the same time, we have a drought problem in Cape Verde. But we cannot see for this problem. We know what we want. As I mentioned, we want to be uh, the first county in Africa in terms of the use of renewable energy. And also, we want to make possible to produce items in Cape Verde. We want to improve agricultural production in Cape Verde, but we don't have water. If we don't have water, how we can do that? So this is the, the, the problem that we have in Cape Verde, but uh, the idea to change that is first, to look for the problem for the water, it's to have energy. If we have energy, we can have water. If we have water, we can produce for even for tourism, even for industry, even for agriculture. But at the same time, when we look to that, we can say where we are and where we want to go for the next, next uh, period. So this is the reason that we first let me thank to the to GCF. We approved last year three uh, readiness, one for the account program that can show us what we, have, we want to do for next next period in terms of the, the climate investment in Cape Verde. And also we have another one for uh, sustainable tourism and another one for uh, blue blue economy. So when we have this, 
with all this idea and the clear idea for, for the, the climate investment in Cape Verde, we can say how, let me just say, how GCF can support our vision. Because we have a clear idea of what we want. We know what we want. And we know how we can do that. The only problem is we don't have a way to do that. And alone, we cannot do that. Um, just to mention, uh, we have been received uh, in terms of the preparation of the project of also the readings for, for Cape Verde. And the readings will not show us um, how or what we need because we know what we need. The only question is uh, alone, as I mentioned, we cannot do all the things that we need because we don't know the way to do that. So this is the reason that I support GCF and also the, all these, the climate fund to look to those counts like Cape Verde, uh, small counts, and also just me do a, a small notes. Uh, we used to be a least developing count, but after 2007, 2008, like more, more precisely, we changed for um, the middle income count. So, we reduce the access to the um, concessional funds to make investment more more uh, uh, easy for, for Cape Verde. And now we have to look for the climate funds to support Cape Verde because now the investment is looked for to see how we can do sustainable development in Cape Verde, look to the climate um, uh, investment and how we can support that. So just to, to finish, to say that uh, yesterday, I saw someone uh, complain about uh, the preparation of the readiness and to see the GCF must to, uh, do, to, to send the money direct to the country. For Cape Verde is different. We know that alone, we cannot do that. We need some development part to support us to prepare the, to prepare the, 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 the process, to prepare the, the, also the project. But at the same time, we need those uh, delivery partners and also G G GCF to support us to prepare to be more capacity, to have more capacity in terms of preparation of the project and also to do the investment happen. We know, as I mentioned, we know what we want. We know where we want to be. For Cape Verde, precisely by 2014, we want to achieve 100% of renewable energy, but it's not only for renewable energy. We want to support the investment in agriculture, in water, uh, water uh, availability, and also for sustainable tourism and blue economy. But we need your support to achieve that, and you need your support to be more development. So thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. Gomez Pina. I certainly can speak for the rest of my colleagues in the GCF that this is precisely the type of partnership uh, where we want to accompany you. We um, certainly, uh, and as I said at the beginning of my presentation, uh, we all know where the needs are. Um, we know what a lot of people want to do. How do we get there? How do we do the proper investment planning? I hope we can uh, set a time when we're here um, and trying to connect with colleagues like my colleague, Maguresh, who has the expertise in, in thinking how we begin to structure some of these ideas. Um, we'll, uh, I'd like to now turn uh, to Mr. Uh, Joaquin Guajardo of uh, the Minister of Finance of Chile uh, to share your perspectives as well um, on, on this process. Muchas gracias. Eh, muy buenos días a todos. Eh, el financiamiento climático eh, es un proceso iterativo y no necesariamente lineal como parte de lo que, de lo que se plantea, ¿cierto?, en este esquema que nos propone el GCF, que si bien el esquema conceptual ofrece, eh, que, que el GCF ofrece, habla desde la planeación, el análisis, el desarrollo de proyectos y su posterior monitoreo, eh, sigue una secuencia bastante lógica, sin embargo en la práctica a la hora de implementar y de, y de proponer políticas, es difícil hablar de que el proceso sea tan lineal. Esto se debe a que los factores que afectan cada uno de los pasos planteados por este esquema están en constante evolución avances tecnológicos, mejoras metodológicas de los cálculos, cambios en los actores que implementan proyectos, cambios regulatorios, coyunturas económicas, incluso podríamos hablar de cambios en la situación sanitaria global y glo eh, local y global, ¿cierto? Bueno, en Chile contamos con una ANS actualizada en el año 2020 y una estrategia, eh, estrategia climática perdón, de largo plazo publicada en el 2021, 
y diversos planes de adaptación sectoriales y nacionales. Junto con esta batería de instrumentos, durante el presente año se promulgó una ley marco de cambio climático que establece de forma regulatoria la institucionalidad climática, los actores relevantes y sus correspondientes responsabilidades. Estos documentos nos ayudan a hacer un diagnóstico de la situación climática en Chile, nos ayudan a identificar nuestros propios desafíos y proponen ejes de acción coherentes con estos desafíos identificados. En este sentido, cabe señalar que por parte del Estado no todas las acciones climáticas requieren necesariamente cierta una inversión, pueden implicar mejoras regulatorias, incentivos fiscales y acciones de coordinación también con el sector privado. En los diversos documentos climáticos elaborados para Chile, desde la perspectiva de la mitigación se identifica al sector energético y en particular a la generación eléctrica como un principal emisor de gases de efecto invernadero. Es por esto que en el año 2019 se elaboró en conjunto con los principales actores de la industria un plan para el retiro de centrales a carbón. Actualmente este plan ha avanzado más rápido incluso de lo que se había planteado originalmente. De las ocho centrales propuestas para cerrar el año 2024, actualmente se contempla el cierre de 18 centrales al año 2025. Así también las empresas generadoras están jugando un rol fundamental en el desarrollo de alternativas de generación limpia, como es el caso del hidrógeno verde. Este ejemplo se los digo simplemente para ilustrar, ¿cierto?, que existe una estrategia con un diagnóstico bien informado y basado, basado en ciencia, y, y la acción que, que de, este, de este plan y de esta estrategia se, 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 se desprende es una acción que es iterativa, que es un proceso que va y vuelve, digamos. De manera complementaria al plan anteriormente mencionado, en el año 2020, Chile desarrolló una estrategia para el desarrollo y comercialización del hidrógeno verde. Esta estrategia, que fue elaborada en forma coordinada con el sector privado, establece una hoja de ruta para transformar a Chile en una potencia mundial en este mercado. Compañías que anteriormente estaban generando electricidad a carbón están en proceso de descarbonización, incluso paralelamente participando activamente de este plan de desarrollo de hidrógeno verde. Estos ejemplos se los menciono simplemente para ilustrar la naturaleza iterativa de la identificación de desafíos, el desarrollo de estrategias y la elaboración de proyectos y monitoreo que se dan en la realidad en Chile hoy. Finalmente, a la hora de financiar, entonces, cuando ya tenemos ya hemos identificado cuáles son nuestros principales desafíos, hemos establecido una estrategia eh, y hemos ya empezado a, a pensar ¿cierto? En, en, en formas de, de acción, entonces se deben considerar los instrumentos más adecuados y al menor costo posible para financiar esta, esta, esta iniciativa. En este sentido, me gustaría destacar dos fuentes de financiamiento climático sostenible que son relevantes desde la perspectiva del Estado de Chile. En primer lugar, eh, los bonos temáticos, que desde el año 2019 Chile emite bonos verdes, sociales y sostenibles, de acuerdo a los lineamientos establecidos por eh, nuestro propio documento Marco de Bonos Sostenibles. Eh, en, marco del presente año, eh, Chile emit, eh, perdón, en marzo del presente año, eh, Chile emitió el primer eh, Sustainability Link Bond eh, como un soberano, digamos, marcando un hito <coughs> en temas de financiamiento sostenible. Actualmente alrededor de nuestro, del 30% de nuestro stock de deuda del fisco es etiquetado como ESG. Y eh, esa, esa es una fuente de financiamiento que para nosotros es muy relevante y otra fuente de financiamiento, justamente por lo que estamos acá, ¿cierto? Es eh, a través de la cartera de proyectos que hemos podido desarrollar con el GCF. En total, Chile ha conseguido financiamiento por 630 millones de dólares para proyectos tanto del sector público como privado, jugando un rol muy preponderante del sector privado. Eh, lo que a nosotros nos gustaría destacar y queremos que de, de ahí se deberían importantes sinergias que nos ayudan justamente com complementando este camino que hemos ido recorriendo. Justamente ahora estamos desarrollando un proyecto de, eh, de multipaís de hidrógeno verde. Digamos en consonancia de toda esta estrategia que, y este camino que ya hemos ido recorriendo. Eh, junto con el financiamiento de proyectos, las líneas Redines están siendo de gran utilidad también para el financiamiento de las actualizaciones de planes de adaptación y el desarrollo de capacidades para el cumplimiento de lo exigido por nuestra nueva ley de marco cambio climático. En síntesis, para Chile, eh, concretar los planteamientos o estrategias en acciones climáticas ha sido un proceso iterativo que ha requerido de una constante revisión y actualización basado en ciencia y en ajustes regulatorios 
para generar las condiciones habilitantes para el desarrollo de proyectos competitivos y eficaces. El modelo conceptual que ofrece el GCF me parece tremendamente útil, porque permite ordenar de manera lógica la secuencia de acciones para que el desarrollo del pipeline de proyectos sea coherente con las estrategias de financiamiento para poder realizar esto y traducir esto en acciones concretas. Sin embargo, es fundamental no perder de vista que se trata de un proceso iterativo que requiere entender muy bien las variables que afectan los desafíos climáticos a los que nos enfrentamos para poder actuar con flexibilidad, así como la coordinación con otros actores relevantes, en nuestro caso con el sector privado, para que la respuesta al desafío sea contundente, oportuna y de la envergadura que se necesita. Muchas gracias. Eh, muchísimas gracias, Joaquín. De verdad que la experiencia de Chile es un punto de referencia que nos ayuda a entender precisamente muchos de estos pasos, pero, pero al mismo tiempo muchos de, de estos retos, de esta naturaleza iterativa de, del proceso. Eh, switching, switching back to English, perhaps I, I will underscore that in this, uh, this uh, approach that we have outlined, the very, late, the very reason we have all these different curves is precisely because we never thought of it as being completely linear. Um, and there will be many points where you have to go back to a few steps and you have to jump at a, at a different entry point. But uh, thank you very much uh, for, for your uh, very rich perspective and uh, points well taken. Last but not least, of course, I'd now like to go um, to Mr. Oscar Guevara of CAF uh, to share, of course, a, a different perspective as a partner Uh, in supporting countries uh, through this process of investment planning. Um, so with this, uh, Oscar. Um, thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Oscar Guevara. I work for CAF, the Latin America Development Bank. Um, next slide. Well, I, we are constantly approached by governments and by individuals who want to, to work with us and to get access to, to the GCF. And I constantly say, um, I constantly have the same answer to, to those who are interested to work with GCF and with CAF, is that think of this like a marriage between three people. So when you get married between three people, you just need to realize that we will be working together to formulate a project proposal for the next year, year and a half, We will be working together for a year or more to get it approved. And then we will be together for the next five years to implement it. So think that we will be married between the National Designated Authority or the government, the GCF, and us at least for the next 10 years. So this is why it's important to carefully select who do you marry with. And the other thing is that, well, our experience is that we have um, implemented seven readiness proposals so far in Latin America, the, in the map I just highlighted in which countries. And right now we have two uh, readiness proposals. Um, based on the experience of, of implementing the, this portfolio readiness proposals, but also on developing and implementing uh, projects with the GCF, I just have uh, four key messages that um, are illustrated in the next slide. Um, probably the first one, is the role of the National Designated Authority. Um, it is common in Latin America and maybe in other parts of the world that sometimes the, the NDA is located in the Ministry of Environment. In other countries, it's in the Ministry of Finance, in others, in the Ministry of Planning, and sometimes it's in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And this has a significant impact on the country ownership. Because, because sometimes uh, GCF projects and also especially the readiness projects are, are, are not exactly understood um, as a project developed for, by the country and for the country. And sometimes it's seen that it's being owned by the NDA. And somehow the, the NDA has this special role of actually try to guarantee the ownership of the country of the project. So, so this is important. And um, again, considering the, the differences between the, 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 the countries in Latin America, one of the things that we have learned is about how the critical role that the NDA has. Um, the second thing is, is about the, the scope of the projects. Um, the first readiness that we implemented before 2020, 2021, 
are actually very limited. The impact that we achieve from these projects, I will say that is very limited, but this is related with another important lesson is that working with GCF requires to be constantly evolving the way we work. It's not only that there are changes in templates, in policies, in the way we report, et cetera, that is changing all the time, but it's actually what countries and accredited entities understand what the GCF is good for. So at the beginning, somehow the, yeah, the, 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 the initiatives and the readiness that we put together were very limited and were targeting very specific objectives. But right now we see that the, the concept of how we can work together is evolving and is shifting into more transformational initiatives. But um, and another point that is highlighted in the middle with says staff is that, again, in Latin America, we are seeing that the NDAs and also the governments have very limited number of staff dedicated, not only to work on the overall climate agenda, but also to work with the GCF agenda. And not only that, it's, it's sometimes it's limited, the, number, the amount of the staff, but also uh, they are constantly being replaced. So that makes it difficult to, 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 to maintain the, um, well, the scene, not, not, not the series, but actually to, to, to maintain the effort and to maintain the progress on, on the activities that, that, that we are working together because the staff is being replaced. And in, in this very same issue about the staff, is that also there is a delimitation about language. Uh, this is uh, something that we also discussed in, in, a, in a parallel session yesterday afternoon, but somehow the, the issue that we have to work in English, actually that all documents provided to the GCF for uh, all the different initiatives, whether if it is a readiness or it's a project proposal, needs all to be uh, done in English, actually limited, limits the possibility to work with uh, local expertise with the local officers that uh, well in, in, in Latin America mostly speak in Spanish or Portuguese and somehow it make us rely a lot on consultants that are bilingual. So that, that's one thing that we, we have learned is, is that there is, a, is still a, a strong barrier on, on language. And probably the, the last one that I would like to highlight is, is in, in right here mentioned as continuity is that another thing that we we have seen in the projects that we have uh, implemented in the past, the readiness projects, is the sustainability of actions. Um, again, without, but in Latin America, the reality is that the vast majority of the climate agenda relies on international cooperation from different funds, not only from GCA, but from multiple donor agencies, et cetera. And somehow it's difficult that um, the readiness projects and, and the different initiatives that were put together to strengthen the climate agenda um, are sustainable in time. And, and, and one of the, 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 the things that we have learned is that actually we need to do an extra effort to think about uh, strategies in order to make more sustainable the, the actions that we, are, that we are proposing and that we are, that we are working together with, with governments. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Oscar. Those are uh, very uh, useful uh, lessons learned. And I know probably uh, learning some of those lessons has come with some pain. Uh, so we we'll appreciate very much the, the continuous support of CAF as a partner. Um, we are now um, going to go back to you. Uh, to uh, First, uh, we'll be using, again, Menti to pick up some of your specific suggestions about how the GCF can help you in the investment planning process, uh, including around some of these ideas of financial support and financial structuring. Um, but uh, we have received uh, some uh, questions also on UBA, and we'll be asking uh, when we go back to the panel, Maduresh, uh, to, to speak to those two questions that were um, asked there. And I would now like to uh, open the floor um, for uh, your questions and your reflections in this topic. Uh, so please, again, I'm, I'm quite blinded here and my colleague Christian is helping me. Um, There's one question here. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, Sohail Malik uh, with, uh, with DAE in Pakistan, NRSP. Um, uh, I had a question from the earlier panelists also, but they were deferred. Basically, um, 
uh, we are struggling, as rightly said, on the climate science of it um, and the data issues. Uh, but uh, as it is the soul of the whole thing, this climate rationale, so uh, DAEs would like to know that for, uh, how does GCF plan to um, evaluate, verify, and validate the climate rationale aspect of the projects uh, that are being prepared? That is the first question. And the second question from CAF in the second session, excellent uh, presentation, sir, and uh, uh, really crisp experiences. Um, you have worked with different, uh, uh, different uh, government uh, setups. Um, and you have shown challenges with the environment and with Ministry of Finance, economy. I mean, it, it creates a big challenge that uh, across, I mean, there's no cross learning if you have a mix of all these different NDAs. And then on NDAs, um, we need to really um, get into um, more of a different role because readiness is more related to private sector and public sector or uh, the players right at the executing level. Uh, so would like to get your reflection on uh, what would be a NDA uh, better placement uh, within the government and also um, you know, what could be the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, how can we decentralize from NDA? NDA, can, NDA is the uh, housekeeper of uh, country ownership. So it should, should it remain at an information level or should it really uh, develop into a lot of uh, bureaucratic layers. I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sahel. Um, any other questions or reflections before I go back to the panel? Okay. Give it, give it a minute. Merci, Monsieur le, le Moderateur. Moi, je vais m'imprimer en français. Mon anglais n'est pas clair. Euh, moi, mon auteur, d'abord, je m'appelle Pierre Lama. Je suis le ND, le ND Guinée, qu'on a créé. Alors, moi, mon impression, c'est vraiment un message qui doit passer, euh, au CCF. Je reviens sur euh, l'intervention du dernier intervenant, sur la question du rôle et le fonctionnement des, des, des NDA sur le terrain. Euh, je voudrais dire aux, euh, aux ICF que les NDA sur le terrain, voilà des gens qui travaillent, mais ils sont comme un peu considérés comme des passeurs de papier. Quand vous voyez sur le terrain et vous avez des projets à faire passer. Vous avez des, des, des non-objections à faire. Même le chef de l'État dans un pays ne peut pas le faire à la place du NDA. Le NDA est comme l'ambassadeur accrédité du CF sur le terrain. Mais les NDA sont très maltraités. Ils sont très maltraités. Souvent, on dit pour les renforcer, il faut qu'il y ait readiness. Et s'il n'y en a pas, ils vont faire comment Voilà des questions sur lesquelles nous devons passer. Voilà aussi euh, des aspects qui sont très importants que les UGF doivent doit prendre en compte. Je pense que les NDA, en dehors des readiness, doivent avoir d'autres capacités qui puissent les permettre de faire leur travail sur le terrain en dehors de ce que euh, les readiness donnent. Ça veut dire quoi si c'est un budget ou bien d'autres possibilités financières qui peuvent avoir à leur disposition en dehors de ce qui vient des readiness. Parce que les readiness, généralement, quand on élabore dans un pays, le, le, les NDA ne reçoivent que par, euh, je peux dire que, même pas par jour, par objectivité. Mais on vient leur dire, bon, on vous assiste. On vous avoir un assistant pour évaluer vos besoins. Le besoin, l'assistant est, est même géré par, par, par l'entité euh, qui doit, qui doit assister, qui doit, euh, qui, qui élabore sur les readiness. Ensuite, même l'élaboration des readiness, le plus souvent, les indignes ne sont pas associés. Voilà des facteurs 
que nous devons porter à votre niveau. Voilà des réalités que nous avons sur le terrain. Si on ne porte pas à votre niveau, vous allez dire que ça marche sur le terrain avec les indiens. Non. Mon frère vient de le dire. Les indiens sur le terrain, sur le terrain ils, ils peuvent être dans n'importe quel département. Mais le traitement n'est pas vraiment fiable. Normalement, c'est une doléance. C'est même un message qui doit passer. Et ce message doit être pris en compte pour que très prochainement, que nous soyons efficaces sur le terrain par rapport à ce que vous allez faire comme appui. Je vous remercie. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your reflection. And before going to the panel, a third question, if any. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Zana Vokopoulia from uh, Urban Research Institute, Albania, representing a delivery partner for Albania. Well, everybody mentioned here the overloaded work the NDA do, does. Therefore, the role of a delivery partner becomes harder because we have to play their role as well. And under these circumstances, does GCF ever thought of a training program, maybe not exactly, but meeting, uh, sharing experiences, manuals that help delivery partners cope well with the government while respecting and following all the GCF procedures and politics. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, we still have some time. We'll hopefully be able to go for another round of questions. Uh, but I first now like to invite uh, my colleagues uh, as well as the fellow panelists uh, to share any reflections they might have on, on these uh, uh, first three questions and reflections. Uh, Kevin, maybe you can start with you. Yes, of course, I'll happily take the question from the gentleman over there. And I, I did see you waving during the original session, but unfortunately, uh, it, t telepathy isn't supported. So I'm glad you got your question in. Um, so the, the short answer is that the, the, the principles that we've established, the board made it very clear that those are principles that both the Secretariat and also our independent panel need to take into consideration during their assessment of proposals. Um, operationalizing that high-level mandate is the job of myself and the team of climate impact experts. And you know, I, I will work, work endlessly to operationalize that in a way that we find the consensus that, that your question implied is needed. I mean, if I could just add something to, the, to my response to the previous questioner, who I can now see, um, and this is not a matter of climate science, this is just a matter of logic. There is never no information. There is always the best available information. And so operationalizing that so that there is a consistent recognition of it is uh, is part of the operationalization of that board decision. Um, but this uh, this forum, this international forum of expertise will home in, will focus on specific questions where there might be divergent opinions in order that as a, as a community uh, of stakeholders and funders, that we all share the same expectations as to how those principles um, are shown and the materials that we provide, the training, the support that we provide in order to demonstrate that those principles have been met. And I think that, that speaks to the message of this entire session, really. The key message here is to offer the support that's required throughout the cycle in terms of this particular aspect of the cycle. What we want to hear, and it's great to see it unfolding on the board in front of us, is what are the best materials, what are the most useful materials uh, to yourselves in order to help you show show that uh, and that's that's what we will provide so um, it's really about supporting the proposal throughout the whole cycle in the way um, that you tell us you need i hope that answers thank you um kevin and i'd like to maybe invite my director there's also questions on the on the chat um with regards to our concessionality and level of concessionality as well as the criteria for whether something is tagged public, private, or if there's a third category, you can help us clarify that um, as well as speak to any of the other reflections or questions. Yeah, so maybe for benefit of our audience, I'll just read out the question first. The, there are two questions. First is, uh, with the GCF, we have two project categories, public project and private projects. Can GCF propose a third category of project, which is public-private project, uh, to also allow collaborate between the accredited entities? 
And the second question is how concessional is GCF? Is it below market rate or just providing long term financing? Now, the first suggestion, you know, is, is having third category. In fact, that is something which is certainly already present in our portfolio that, you know, most of these projects are not only public sector or only private sector. There is, you know, some amount of intervention by private sector, even in a public sector projects as you will or so. So, so, so while we may have a third category going forward, there is nothing that stops to have active collaboration of public and private uh, uh, actors in a country uh, in a GCF project. Uh, one way maybe, you know, the co-investment platform is something that will facilitate uh, sovereign and private entities in a country to collaborate on, on, on the investment uh, raising side as well as on the investment implementation side. Also. The second question that talks about uh, concession, how concessional is GCF, is it only below market? Uh, can it go below market? So, so the answer is uh, GCF is concessional to the extent of making the project viable. And by saying project viability, we say that, you know, it has to be uh, financially attractive for the other stakeholders. Uh, it, it has to have a suitable trade-off for risk, trade-off between the risk and return profile for the co-investors also. So, so the answer is GCF, while it provides long-term patient capital, it also accepts below market returns. So it is possible that, you know, uh, equity investment in a country is expected to generate uh, just 8% returns and co-investors require a hurdle rate of minimum 10% or so. In that situation, GCF to uh, achieve that climate impact does settle down for a lower interest rate, but but a lower lower interest rate or lower IRR if it's equity investment or so. So so the so the answer is yes. GCF has flexible approach, but we need to uh, see a high climate impact materializing out of GCF's concessionality. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I'd like to uh, also invite our panelists for any reflections. I know there were couple of questions where maybe uh, our colleague from CAF might, might be able to share a, an opinion, uh, particularly on the question of uh, supporting uh, NDA capacity and, and just perhaps if we can hear more from the CAF experience on that. Um, thank you, yeah. Th th thank you for, for also for the question because um, one of the, 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 the key messages that we have learned and we need to constantly remind not only to ourselves but also to our stakeholders including the the ndas is that um the process of of formulating and implementing readiness projects and project proposals with is based on the architecture of the paris agreement and the the fact that the paris agreement is su successful but in addition to that is inspirational is because it is a country driven process. So every country is putting together its own commitments to achieve a global goal. And how the, 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 the architecture to access GCF finance is largely replicating that, that vision and that concept of the Paris Agreement. So basically this is a process that it's country owned, but and there's a, a big but on, on, on my answer, is that also it is important to take into account national circumstances and country ownership. And these two questions are always present in, in, in every template that we need to fill in order to, to develop a project proposal for readiness or for regular funding. But we should not underestimate the importance of, of, the, of those questions is that because the process of accessing climate finance is country owned, just like the overall climate agenda to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement is country owned. We need to be very honest about the national circumstances and the possibilities to actually to overcome the, 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 when, when these circumstances are difficult, but also how to effectively foster processes that actually empower and actually achieve that vision of country ownership. So, but again, the, the, at, at the end, an important reminder and, and an important message that we always try to transmit is that what we are doing with the GCF is actually our contribution to achieve the vision and the goals on the Paris Agreement that largely depends on country ownership. 
Thank you very much. Any other or panelists, uh, any further reflections? Otherwise, um, I will go back for maybe two more questions from the floor. Okay. Yes, please, please. Sorry, I couldn't see you. Thank you. Just, just want to comment to say, um, there's a question to say that uh, usually the NDAs, they don't have capacity, they don't have a team allocated to work with, um, with a GCF. I think this perspective should be more comprehensive. Uh, look to Cape Verde, let me talk, talk, talk by myself. I am National Director for Planning and I'm also NDA for GCF. I'm not only one work with GCF. I have a, I have a team. There's a team that work with me and all this team should be focused on the strategy. As I mentioned in my intervention, um, we have goals. We know what we want. And if you know what we want, we should allocate our team or capacity to achieve that. Uh, in National Directorate of Planning, we work also with other partners as a World Bank, African Development Bank, and so on. So for each one, we have one uh, let me say focal point, but more than focal point, we have a team that work with this focal point. So for this, we have also to think about for GCF and also for NDA. In Cape Verde, uh, instead of that in the NDA, we create a team uh, uh, composed by all the ministries work with uh, uh, climate change. For example, agriculture ministry, um, uh, environment ministry, energy ministry, uh, Minister of Commerce and also Minister of Finance. So that means this team has to think about how we can achieve these goals that we think for, for Cape Verde. So I think if you want, we have to allocate. If you want to do something, you have to allocate the source to do that. So this is the challenge we have. But as I mentioned before, the question is we want to do, we need to do, but sometimes there's a lack of capacity. We need to build in capacity and also to support those to prepare the, let me say, to prepare the, the, the project and also to see uh, how we can achieve what, what we want. So just to finish is to say, we have a team. The government has a team. NDA is not from a simple uh, uh, entity, it's from government. If you are for government, you have to see who can support you and how you can work together to achieve those goals. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, a very important point, of course, on leveraging the resources around you. Um, I don't see any requests from the, the panel at this moment. I'd like to see if there are any further questions. Uh, Christian, if you can help me. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, colleagues. and. Um, Big congratulations to all the panel uh, speakers. A very uh, informative discussion. My name is Ruel Yamuna. I'm the Special Envoy for Climate uh, in my country, Papua New Guinea, and also the ND for the Green Climate Fund. Um, I, I have a comment and a question. I guess my first comment is uh, uh, I agree with uh, the points uh, mentioned uh, with um, some of the, the distinguished panelists. Um, NDAs in particular need uh, dedicated support, um, given all the good uh, interventions um, that GCF is doing in terms of helping uh, advance investment planning and, and uh, uh, financial support. Um, there is a need to ensure that there, um, there's dedicated support given to NDAs. I think one comment yesterday was the $300,000 um, uh, that's earmarked for NDA support, perhaps that can be increased to uh, assist, boost their capacity and to help them uh, perform their um, their function, we, we obviously given their additional um, uh, responsibilities back at home. And this is for me speaking from experience. Um, so that's just a, a quick comment. Um, my question, I guess, goes to um, any of the GCF colleagues uh, on stage uh, with regard to the, the country program. Um, the uh, the issue that I, I see or the concern that I see is a disconnect between some of the priorities in the country program and the, the board position on some of these issues. For example, um, with adaptation issues, um, we have 
given regional consultations that have taken place in the uh, past year or so, there's been a, a concern from communities that there's a need for dedicated support to be given to uh, displaced communities uh, or climate-induced migration. As we all know, this is a, a bit of a sensitive topic, uh, but the issues keeps on recurring. Uh, and so we've captured that in, in, the, in the country program. Uh, my question is, what is the GCF board position in terms of giving support to um, communities uh, who are requesting support uh, for the relocation resettlement um, from, from one area to another? And that's, I guess, um, one uh, key aspect that um, I need uh, clarity on just so that I can uh, better inform uh, my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have one last question here at the front. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm Alamgir from uh, Itpal, Bangladesh. Uh, my question is to GCF. Uh, given the foreign exchange volatility and fluctuation, uh, is, was, is there any plan from GCF to, uh, you know, uh, to, to have the local currency lending capability? Is there any plan you have to increase the capacity and lending in local currencies? Because, you know, so far what was happening is uh, the governments were, in some cases, taking over the exchange risk, where many of our local borrowers uh, whose receivables is in local currency would want to take you know, uh, funding in local currency because of the exchange risk. Uh, but now with the volatility and uncertainty, many of the government agencies are not willing to give that kind of hedging. And many of the markets, uh, you know, in here is does not have a long-term hedging uh, capacity. So in that case, whether GCF could come forward in in providing local currency facilities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm, we're very short of time. Um, actually, I, I sit in the in the governance team, so I can actually answer briefly on this, these two questions. Uh, first, on local currency, I'm pleased to say that we have made some progress on this issue and it is some, it is an option now. Uh, we can follow up offline on this, um, but this is something we were piloting and maybe Majores can say a, a word or two on this. Um, on relocation, uh, the answer is we can work on the issue. Uh, there's nothing stopping us from doing this. We we'll need to put it, of course, in the context of providing a long-term um, uh, solution uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in line with the investment criteria of the fund. Uh, but this is something that we can uh, engage in a conversation as we know that these, these needs are growing. Um, I'd like to go to the panelists, invite them for just 30 seconds conclusions uh, and any comments they, they may wish to, uh, to put forward uh, before we conclude. Maybe starting um, on, if we can maybe start on this side, Kevin, uh, anything you want to add um, and just uh, go down the, the panel. I, I think I would just like to pick up on the, um, on the final point made by our colleague from CAF about the importance and the value of continuity. Um, and I think one of the things that we have realised and, and we are speaking to today is the need to provide the right support at the right stage of the diagram with which Juan introduced this session uh, to make sure that nothing gets forgotten in the pipeline. Now, of course, um, country programs may change, uh, and that, of course, is, is the prerogative of the country. Um, but as as projects move from issues to concepts to concept notes, providing the right support at the right place in the pipeline, just to reinforce what, my, what I, our friend from CAF said, uh, to make sure that continuity is there is, is something that I think uh, will, will greatly enhance uh, the quality and the flow of projects. Thanks. Are you ready? Thank, thanks to our uh, guests and, and you know bringing out this perspective and I think you know some of these are certainly uh, learning lessons for us and some of these are like you know certainly replicable uh, for other countries as well. So, so thanks. I, I don't have anything else to add. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Joaquin. Anything you'd like to conclude? Sí, eh, nada, simplemente me gustaría destacar el hecho de que eh, el GCF tiene el potencial de ser un socio estratégico para el fortalecimiento de la institucionalidad climática en cada uno de los países y en parte eso también es responsabilidad de nosotros como eh, autoridad nacional designada poder aprovecharlo eh, y poder eh, de alguna manera cierto eh, plasmar en el programa país, que es la principal herramienta que se tiene, eh, 
esta, estas visiones que, que, que se vienen complementando desde la NDC, desde la estrategia climática a largo plazo y, y la institucionalidad, en ese sentido, la estrategia que cada, uno, que cada país eh, tenga establecida, ¿cierto?, para armar una visión y proyectos que estén alineados con esto. Creo que eh, en eso eh, el GCF puede ser un, un, un socio estratégico. Y así que nada, muchas gracias por. Muchas gracias. Um, Krishna. I think uh, most of the vulnerable country who are suffering with the existential risk uh, by the impact of the climate change need really uh, great support from the GCF since uh, the capacity of this country is very weak in preparation, in preparation for any kind of plan, developing projects and also in implementation. So uh, most of the conditional and unconditional both sides, I think uh, resources and uh, enough investment are required from the GCF and international community to 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 uh, make the NDC plan more effective and better. So I think uh, 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 reshipping, uh, re-engineering and uh, reforming the existing uh, management and administrative uh, governance of the N GCF is required to support the countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you. Now, my last comment is that I think that especially for the future, the GCF offers an opportunity to be more ambitious on, on the kind of projects and readiness proposals that we will put together. And there are um, opportunities, and I think the, the overall framework that the GCF put together for, for investing and supporting countries allows the opportunity for, for, for the countries to, 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 again, put together ideas that um, are risky, but are important. So the ambition component, I think, is essential. And, and I hope to see that in the future, there will be projects that are transformative, that are ambitious, and that actually are in, in line with, with, with the vision that each country has in, in its own NDC commitment. And Yosun, you have the last word. So thank you. Now, first, let me thanks to, to GCF and special for the Cape Verde team at GCF for the, the availability and also for the support that we have been, been received. Uh, but now let me talk, uh, not only for Cape Verde, I've been talking about for Cape Verde, but now it's for developing count. Um, we have been prepared for readiness and the reader proposal has been accepted, but I think now is the moment to, to do the step, to do the jump from readiness to the real investment uh, project. So I think this is the moment and GCF uh, must look to special for the developing count to support and also to, to work on climate change. As I mentioned, uh, for those countries, climate change should be done, should be looked for uh, economic issues. So when we look to that, we, we, we can see that it's, it's the time to do the investment. So GCF to, has to or must to look to those, those counts and support them. So this is my request. And also for our side, it's moment also to work and to make more time and to make the, 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 the team available to work with GCF and also to prepare for achievement of our goals. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I would like to, of course, thank all of you for your active participation. We uh, received quite a lot of feedback also in this last session. We will be looking at this um, just like we did yesterday and considering in our, in our follow-up work as we go into developing the, the revised strategic plan. And for now, and to conclude, I would like to uh, thank our panelists uh, for uh, their wonderful insights and for um, joining us today. So thank you very much and let's uh, give them a round of applause.